Good evening, everybody. My name is Mira Nurmela. For this presentation, you can call me the guy who made mistakes, because most of this talk is going to be about mistakes I have made in the past. Uh, but first, I actually have a surprise announcement. We have a special guest, Michael, talking about Delphi today. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we don't actually. He made me put the slide here, but I found it funny, so here we are. Uh, before we move on to hard estimations, I'm going to show you a couple of like test names I had for this presentation. First one of them is Uncle Miro's therapy session, because there's uh, therapeutic things I'm going to say during this, which can help me. Second one is don't be like this guy and, and screw up your estimations by one year or multiple years, which is good life, good life advice for anyone. Third one is how hard can it be? And then there's the mystical hand of reality, which says, we'll see. But anyway, the actual presentation is 11 lessons about hard estimations. And let's see what we are going to do today. Uh, we have five parts. Hopefully, the third one is the longest one. So, But le let's talk first about what are hard estimations in this context. Why are we doing this? Why are not we talking about technology? Uh, the lessons I have learned, and maybe you will help find helpful. Then we ha I have some good news about people who want superpowers. And in the end, maybe a short, short discussion about pos possible superpowers. So all right, let's begin. Hard estimations, what are they? So one, one thing that you can find on Wikipedia about hard estimations is that the more you have unknowns in your, in your data set or the things you're trying to estimate, the harder they become. It is easy to estimate the things you know. If you have implemented your website or your design or whatever 10,000 times and somebody comes and asks you, hey, Mira, can you do me a React website in two weeks? I will say, yes, I can do, in fact, do a React website in two weeks. Somebody comes and asks me, Mira, can you do a React website with an unknown integration in two weeks? I will say, probably not, because your integration is probably bad. And then somebody comes and tells me, do you know things about this language here I've never heard of? in this context and domain I've never heard of. So then I will say it's very hard to estimate because there's a lot of unknown unknowns in this. Uh, a more practical view of thinking about hard estimation is that they are either ones with that have a long horizon, more than one month is, in my opinion, a long horizon to, to estimate because it's, really, it's quite easy to estimate for a sprint or two sprints, but after that, the, the third sprint is already going to be something later. It's going to contain things that you, uh, you're at the present, you don't know what are going to be there. So if you can, g tell me, and we'll make a lot of money with our new framework. Or then there's high uncertainty, which can come from either dependencies, things that you didn't know, a requirement, shifting, shifting goals, or, or something like that. So this is the context we're talking about here. And all right, so then next question, why am, why am I talking about this? Well. I have made some mistakes in the past, and I'm, I'm not proud of them, but I, need, I was young and needed money. Uh, but anyway, so I'll tell you some uh, things I learned, and I hope that they will learn. When you encounter situations like this, they, these lessons will help you to not repeat my mistakes. And estimating is something, at least for me, that has never been formally taught. So I thought maybe there are other, people's in the other people in this company who are, who are asked to give estimates on things, and then you know, then they hand wave some, some estimate out, and that's it, and we'll, we'll sell, sell it to, the, to our clients, and here we go. So I hope this helps in that regard. But there's actually some, actually some science also behind this, or why I'm talking here is that the, the papers tell us that 60 to 80 percent of uh, software projects go over time or budget, which is a big number considering that it's like, it should probably be a little less. And then the second reason is that uh, when research about estimation met methods, there are like frameworks and uh, structured ways to do estimation, but they sort of lose to expert estimation, which is what we usually do. We are given uh, a set of requirements and use your head brain to figure out how long this is gonna take. It's still the best method, thanks science, but still, if you look at the first number above, it's not doing very well. So I, I'm trying to, let's see if I, we can make some tools to make that better. But there's even more bad news for people because people are also really bad in estimation, estimation and thinking in general. There is, uh, these are documented uh, so like philo psychological pro phenomena that appear when people try to estimate. One of them is, is called planning fallacy. 
in short and in layman terms, if I understand correctly, it means that uh, you, when you're asked to plan something, you don't take into account the past history. You just look at your task and be like, I can totally do this. Like I can think of all the possible con like sort of country uh, ways that can, this can go, and you always underestimate in that scenario. But and by the way, if you overestimate for somebody else, you overestimate. So you 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 think you are better than the others, and so on. And anchoring is a method used in it, it used to mean that if I give you an estimate now, it's going to take one week, and once you hear the number one week, we, that is something all we are going to talk about. So we are going to like always come to that one week estimate. If it changes, it changes from the one week up or down, but we never forget the anchor point we do. This is actually also a, a technique in negotiation. For if you have to negotiate for hostages, then you can start for with anchoring the discussion to like something and then use the same loophole of human psychology. There are some uh, links and references to scientific papers in, this, in the end of this presentation for these things. And yeah, as mentioned, we need to estimate all the time. And it's also a good life skill. Like if you need to estimate, can you write your book in the National, National Novel Writing Month this, this month? Or can you, get, do, you, do you have time for your hobbies? You need to estimate, so these are the things you should take care of. All right, now that we have gone through the science, let's move to the anecdotal part. And about the lessons. Lesson number one, don't fall for the planning fallacy, which I also already mentioned. The easiest way to do this, uh, according to science and personal experience, is sort of when you need to estimate, you need to sort of stop pulling things out of your sleeve, look back at your history, as I did in the beginning. Can you do a React web app in two weeks? Well, I have done a React web, web, web app in two weeks. I can do it. But sort of with hard estimations, of course, it's usually with domains you don't know about. So then you need to find other people who have done that similar thing and sort of try to find a baseline estimation from there. So don't just trust your like intuition how long it's going to take. It's bad, and you should feel bad for using it. That's number two. And this is also from science. So basically, don't get dragged by the anchor. So you will, there will be a project for everybody, for me, it has happened now a couple of times, so that in the initial, you, you will get uh, from the, you will you will have a sort of initial set of requirements, and you will estimate in the beginning that this is going to take six months, and then the requirements change, but then you are still in the six-month estimate. You might have doubled the amount, amount of requirements, but when you are trying to sort of try to adjust your estimate, you start from the six months and then you like inch it up like oh, it's going to be seven months. It's not that much even though you have doubled your sort of things. So take care of that. Also, very important is that when you get to know your team where you're working with better, there's gonna be a trend in estimation. Like if something, if things start going wrong and like the work amount increases, for example, due to the size of the project or the complexities involved in that, there's gonna be a trend that like how, how the estimation is gonna go. And if you don't take that into account when estimating for new things, you are probably screwed either way. So take into account the trends of that. Lesson number three. This is a real conversation with the name changed for the person uh, of, the, of the manager role here. So don't answer the wrong questions. I, I, in this scenario, I was asked, so how long is gonna, the project going to take? And then I looked at the backlog and said, it's going to take six months. One year later, the same project is still going on, and I'm asked again the same question how long is the project going to take? I look at the backlog and say, it's going to take six months. So obviously at some point here, something went wrong. And here I am making the same mistake in both of these answers. I'm answering the wrong question. It's, the question is not how long the things that are in the backlog are going to get to be implemented. It's how the, long the project is going to take. And at this time, later respect to the project, the backlog didn't contain all the, all the things. So you have to be really very careful when you start spouting estimates like this, is that are you actually answering the real question, especially if you have unknown unknowns? Which leads to, uh, to, to lesson number four, is that if you can't enumerate all the tasks, as I couldn't in the previous task, your estimations are going to be incorrect. So don't, don't go estimating on like, to sort of if we are talking about Scrum, you have epics that are big, large, uh, hairy pieces of business or then they are something else, or concepts like, I need, to, I need something like this implemented. 
it's not enough for you to like dig your claws into it and make estimates out of it. You need to break it down more. Sounds very simple, but you can easily forget it when you once you get this sense of that I know what this project is, is all about. Uh, lesson number five. Your project is proceeding and you are doing very well. Sprints are going well. You, you are hitting your sprint goals. That does not mean necessarily that you are hitting your long-term goals. And for some signs of this might, it might include, for example, that your sprints are including things like fixing bugs, uh, fixing integrations, pending some permissions from clients, IT or whatever. You probably didn't account for this when you were doing the plans, and you should then also readjust your estimates. And also, you in the th sort of like, if you are in the thick of implementation, like you're fighting the everyday problems of like, this library doesn't compile, and like, this, this language is missing a feature I want, and, and I, I wrote a bug here somewhere yesterday, but I can't find it anymore. You are not then the best person to monitor the overall progress. And this is a very important task, and somebody else, somebody should, uh, needs to do it. Mm. Lesson number six. Figure out if your project is a research project. Because there are, there are different kinds of projects. Some of them are the can you implement a website in two weeks project. You probably can. If your project includes supercomputers, PhDs, and things that have never been done before, by, as, as said by your client, you are probably doing a research project, which means that sort of your estimates are lacking, the baseline of your estimates is probably incorrect. And sort of then you, the, the best I can do here to give you advice is expectation management, because people are more lenient if they understand that you are doing something new, but if they are assuming that this is what the thing that you do every day, you are probably you are probably in trouble because you you have a sort of a dissonance in what you th what you think you can do and what the client thinks you can do. Lesson number seven, and this is a more subtle one. I call it "Don't build false equivalencies." So here in the in this very informative picture, there's a equi inequivalence that is true: a fork is not a spoon. But replace those two with. Uh, with software components, for example, that do similar things. You can eat with a spoon and you can eat with a fork. And imagine that, you know, they share some code. They, they, they're using a library that using the sort of same bit of space, base code. It took two months for you to implement the fork, and now you need to implement the spoon. How long is it going to take? And Miro in the past was like, easy. One month. I already know how, how to make a fork. I am the master of the forks. As it turns out, it took more and more time for the second one to implement because it was a different thing. Fork is not a spoon, and you would eat different things with that. You, it comes with different baggage, different, different features, different nuance. And of course, at that time when I made this estimate, the, the spoon wasn't even completed either, so. Uh, lesson number eight. If your requirements keep changing all the time, the initial estimates, the, the anchor points you made in the beginning are probably also incorrect. Because, you, and, and sometimes when you change requirements, your architectural things that you made in good faith based on the original requirements might become obs obsolete, which means that you will have to readjust your estimates. And sort of, this calls for you to know a, the require, what, what you have built. You have to know your product, you have to know why you did the things that you did, because when they change, you have to be able to reason why, they, why the others need to change and what other things need to change. And of course, this is a sort of an ad added point towards the anchoring and uh, the research process co project concepts. This is for all the data scientists. Hey, uh, if there's a lot of data involved in your project, you should know how much data is involved in your project. Because if, you're, if your big data is 1,000 rows in a database, you can handle it with poor data structures and you can do terrible mistakes and your project won't crash. If you are gener generating 30 kilo gigabytes of data every day, then you, ne then you need to take it in into account in your, in your application design, your database designs. So don't, don't do as I, I may have done in, the, done in the past and just assume because it's 2018 and your power, your, uh, blah, blah, your computers are very powerful that they will deal with all the big data they can. They won't, 
and they can't, so, so take into account. So do your back of the envelope math, know what's the magnitude, and then you will be much happier. And yeah, this is another other performance issue. I have, to re I regrettably have said these words, exactly. Like, you know, what could go wrong? It's 20, 2016, 17 or whatever. Performance is not an issue. The Chrome is so blazing fast. And of course, after implementing the various uh, performance boosting features, one year later, Chrome is still crashing and your data is still not being visualized. So, sort of be humble in the face of like complexities of computer science. It's not always easy, even though in this day, day and age of supercomputers and fast things. Lesson number 11, the last one. If you don't understand the requirements, I don't trust your estimates. So this is a big challenge, especially when they come from various different places, new domains with bigger, big problems, or even the supercomputers. Sort of like you, you, you are handed the 100 page document, you read it and you're like, 75 pages of this were nonsense, and out of the 35 were prices. So like, this is, this is like, this is very helpful. And of course, usually if this is the case, I, the requirements will grow and change during the project, as in this example where the requirement document grew, grew up in size 50% during the project, which was actually never like addressed, but it sort of grew. So take this into account. All right, but also, also, before we talk about superpowers, because they are cool now because of Marvel and DC, well, not DC, Marvel. Uh, <laughs> sick burn to DC people. Uh, does anyone else want to share their mistakes at this point? We can share it in the end too. Everyone's so quiet, they're looking at me like I'm the worst person, so it's fine. I've been talking about estimation and how it's hard, and it is, but people who, who have super forecasting or super estimation skills, they exist, and they do walk among us. And there's a bunch of research, well, not a bunch, but there's some research about this and what, what does it mean to be a super, super forecaster. The, the good news for everybody is that anyone can be a super forecaster. The, one of the papers linked here, number five, is a story about forecasting tournaments where some government set up game, like co competitions, how to, for, like, to forecast like big things like terrorism or global warming or other things. And the people who won those were not the, were, were not the uh, intelligence agencies who had classified information. They were people who were accessing data through Google and being humble about what they know and uh, like trusting baseline estimates. So basically, if, y if, I, if I were to estimate the probability of a terrorist attack in the near future in Finland, I should, instead of t t t thinking of what's happening in the Middle East now or in, the, uh, in South America now or what happened in Turku a couple of years ago, I should look at the data and say, well, in the last 10 years there was one or whatever. So in the next 10 years there's probably al also going to be one. Is there going to be one next month? No. So like that, and this is how you can build the super forecast estimates. But then the, then the question arises, if you want to be a super, super um, software uh, project forecaster, you need some data for this. And that some of the data exists. I was going to use futurist data for this, but then Michael told me that it's bad, so I didn't. So I, it, that, that project is still pending. So the <laughs> Sorry guys, NDA can't do. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. It made sense. Uh, there's a Or we can just go the whole bunch right now to Solana, <laughs> switch off recording, then we can talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have that data unprocessed. I have it, but I I might do something with it later, sooner or later. Uh but there's a there's a project called quantitative software management or it's a company or whatever. And they publish this data, for example. And this data, for example, shows that since 2010, the, the average software project takes 11 months. And I don't know if anyone here knew this number. I certainly didn't. So it's like the average software project takes one year. So if you start estimating a new project, you should probably start from that. 
it's going to take one year, and then we're going to start adjusting it based on the things that we know, learn from the project. Uh, the uh, good fact about that, mm. early in futurized history, mm. I would say in, uh, since about 2007 until 2014, uh, statistically, in futurize, most of the mobile projects were taking exactly two persons working for two months. Most of those projects were actually mobile projects. Not mobile web, but native mobile projects. So that was a hard fact, and a lot of estimates were based on this baseline and superpowers, as uh, Miro said. Mm. Yeah. So we have this data also available for us from our, our markings and plan mill data and things. And I was going to do it for this, but then I didn't have time, and I was forbidden, so I didn't. But I'll see if I can... Not, not forbidden. You can mm. totally free to break your NDA. So. <laughs> yeah, that's for that. I'm not going to do that. But anyway, th this is something that would be very, in very in in interesting for our estima estimation purposes. This also tells that COBOL was pretty cool for a long time. So, uh, yeah. So we actually do have time because I probably spoke pretty fast during this presentation. I have been told I do that all a lot. So no, no, no <laughs> never. Yeah. That's probably happened. Anyway, now it's time for discussion. If you have some, if you want to know more about what I did wrong, or if you have something to share at this time, this is a good time for that. But let's start from the big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who's going to be the first one? Doesn't. Thank you for your talk. And closer. Hello. Eat, eat can the you mic. Hear me? Uh, so you mentioned about a year is a good place to start. So what, what if they say, hey, we need an MVP? And uh, so would you say like 75% MVP might be nine months and 25% MVP might be <laughs> three months? What do you think? I mean, that sounds like a reasonable way to approach it. That's exactly in the papers and in the book that they do it. They take the number and then they reduce or add according to the metric they choose. And experience helps. If you are building an MVP, that's usually like hacking. You take, you, you scrap and put on your hacker gloves and like pull out the tricks that you know about the, all, all the frameworks and you can get it done probably faster because it's not quote unquote production level. Of course, MVPs always end up in production, but that's a, that's a separate talk about. Yeah, like well, because it's a product, right? <laughs> it's not a prototype. Yeah. So it's not yeah. minimum viable prototype. So it's minimum yeah. viable product. But that, but that is exactly the approach they are proposing. Like sort of like imagine how much is it from the from the full product? It's fifty percent, so then it takes six months. So anybody else? I can't believe there was only one question. Great. Throw. <laughs> All right. Uh, I would actually argue that the best approach is to estimate as l as little as possible. So I didn't know it's not it's not always possible, but as m the more you estimate, the more uncertainties you get. So estimate only what you need, and mm. then do that again and again and again, but only the near future if it's possible. That will make it more accurate. Mm. Yeah, I see you are from the agile way of way of doing things. <laughs> that's a that's a new. I like it. I like your approach, <laughs> and I agree. I would avoid, of course, a, a sort of. A if you can, you should avoid estimating for more than one month. I don't disagree with that. But the reality is that there will be a client who comes asking you, Kim, I need you to build this. And I need to, I need to approve of the money funding for this. How long is it going to take? And they won't accept an answer that, I have no idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I can tell you that it is at least one month. And then some months after that, <laughs> like, I, I certainly hope that would be the chase state of things. Like that is that is the dream, as they say, but the reality is that sort of you need to at the current world, and I I don't sort of like I don't think that you never should stop estimating the whole thing. There's a good good sort of there is some knowledge in like trying to gauge like how big is it, because like you need to put money into it, and sort of like people are not ready to for the 
to sort of invest half a month and be like, and then you then you go there like, well, we made ten percent of the thing, so there's like I don't know sixty months le 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 ready to go. So at least have a, like a sort of a magnitude estimate is good. Of course, I have failed that too many times, so it's like it's not that easy. But no. I would say that uh, majority of the uh, consulting projects where in the business where we are. Even when we are talking about open budget, it's always there is a somewhere budget cup. And uh, the best projects that uh, agile teams can get into are really, let's have a team of X amount of specialists working for X amount of months and we see what we're going to have. Assuming that all those specialists are the super awesome futurized people, of course. So this works in uh, quite a few projects and we have those, but those are exceedingly rare because in the end, they're gonna be a budget cup always and we have to come up with some kind of a reasoning why we're asking for this amount of time or money. So there is no way out of that. There's just like no, not in this physical universe with the current financial system, how we're working. Yeah. Uh, a quick question before you ask question. A lot of, a, lo a big part of estimation is about communication. Like you can always preface your estimates with, this is with the, confiden like the confidence level. I'm 90% that this happens, I'm 50% that this happens, and sort of offload some of the decision making to the people you are communicating with. But you need sort of like, it shows professionalism and it shows what you are doing if you have constructed good estimates and they are based on baselines or like experience or there's a way you approached it. Because it also gives you structure and it's, it's sort of like, it's a mental exercise to help you spot, for example, pitfalls in the project before you do it. Because like if, if you just head so head first, be like, let's let's go full agile and like burn burn the waterfall books and whatever, that would be great. But there is value in long term estimation, and it it fluctuates between projects. But like if you'd have no idea where you're going, it's hard to sort of argue, for example, decisions you're making now. And then if you are trying to vision the future, you already have to do some sort of estimates about it. Yeah. Okay, so you, you have this year estimation, you have this data behind you, and you're like, okay, seven person team takes one year Java project, and you're like, okay, but you're gonna use Kotlin, you're gonna use React, you're gonna be able to build this faster, our problem's much smaller than a typical project, we're gonna do super MVP, it should be less than a year, can we get the budget down? <laughs> That's the rebuttal, H how do you respond? I mean, Probably, I, I've actually been in this situation, and then and I, I, have, I have told them that then you will get some parts of it. Like, you it, sort of, I feel that your question is more about negotiation sort of strategy, and that is uh, sort of, uh, that is an art in, in itself. Like, estimates are always, they are like a logical exercise. Like, take into account this and this and this, and here is that. And then sort of when you, when you cross the line to talking with other people about estimates, then it becomes a negotiation. And sort of if you have the data to back it, sort of like it's on their peril if they ignore your, your things. But then sort of, then my, my answer is, because I'm not a liar, is that you're gonna get less probably. Or then you are like, it might quite work. Or then we got features. Or maybe, maybe we sort of, maybe we use this as the, a target, but we work time and material. Like let's use the estimate to build the sort of what, what Michael was saying, like the, the cap. And then we start building, we'll see where we end up with. And if, if, the, if that's good enough, then we work with you. If it's not, if they're probably not the kind of people you want to work with either, so. Uh, I'm crashing your talk with the <coughs> one, one. With the knowledge. With one way of uh, dealing exactly what you are saying is uh, asking the potential client what is the margin of error which is acceptable in the estimate. And then we are going to the question is like, in most cases, if customer is reasonable to the point where we would like to work with such client, they would say, mm, I don't know, five to 10%, I can deal with that. And then when you are starting to think about, hey, it's 2018, 19 soon and we have Kotlin and super awesome supercomputers etc etc so it should be faster than 
last year we did with the same team with the uh, Java and Spring Boot, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but what modern science, computer science says is that all the modern advances in languages and tooling and setup, they are not going to be doubling anymore of potential time savings. They are going to be super awesome if like within a 10% range. And then we are hitting this, you know, the estimate margin of error that customer allowed you. So it actually doesn't really matter what you choose in the end, as long as you have at least some kind of experience in a solid team. Sorry, mm. Ossi, I... Mm. Oh, and I actually have a one joke for about that. There's, there's an old programmer joke is that what one programmer can do in one month, two programmers can do in two months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I haven't actually been Any asked I haven't actually been asked for any long time uh, estimations ever. Good for you. But I, I was I was like thinking that um, if you have like a bigger theme of things, you don't know which tasks you're going to estimate. I would assume that you tend to underestimate individual like or even overlook entire tasks that you need to perform yes so is that like thing that happens every time or can you somehow mitigate that well well first answer is if you don't pay attention to it, it probably happens every time because there's, you can really read it, check out the literature, for example, in the presentation, but like people are really bad at sort of going slow and thinking things through. It's the way our minds are built according to behavior, economics, and other, other fields of psychology. Uh, one thing that has helped, at least me in the past, is like when push comes to shove, just en enumerate, like sort of sit down, and enumerate all the things. Just like write them down. Get an Excel sheet, get a piece of paper, and sort of like just like start hammering those things down there. Because if you don't have a, an aid, you will definitely miss something because you sort of like, you, you, like your mental capacity is probably not enough to like maintain all the bits and pieces in memory. And it's like using something like Excel or other estimation tools, you can lay out like a unforgiving computer program which tells, tells that like, sum up these tasks, you, what do you get? Well, you get that this takes two years, and then you're like, here, here we are, like it's gonna probably take two years, so. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Okay. Hello. What uh, up? So, what tools and processes have you found useful to estimate, or to help you estimate? Yeah, so, yeah. so tools and processes for me sort of well, f first thing uh, I'm gonna refer back to, back to the science is that like formal processes of estimation have not been found to be more, uh, more, more better than expert estimation. Of course, experts use some sort of process to do that, but sort of like, so, and well, I was unaware of this, but I have never used like actual physical tools for, for doing that. Uh, for, for long-term estimation, something what I just sort of described for OSI has been very helpful sort of enumerating all the tasks and sort of breaking down big things. Like if you have concept level or like epic level ideas, like I need to build a new kind of visualization. I need to build a new kind of data processing pipeline, which is, which is like an easy thing to explain, but when you break it down, it becomes more specific. You need to build an API, you need to build an integration. There's uh, this new library you need to, you need to try out three new libraries. There's an also problem of how, how to do this and this and this. So it's like, the best, most efficient process I have had is just like, so it's like a, r a raw physical breakdown of, of the tasks. And it doesn't, like, doesn't have to be exactly correct, but as long as you sort of put your mind into thinking, what are the actual tasks? Because as said, like short-term estimation is pretty easy. And it's sort of like sort of reducing the problem of long-term estimation to like a sequential short-term estimation is much better, uh, sort of has been for me the best way to tackle like long-term estimations. Of course, you need to apply then different kind of like multipliers because unless you are 
the master, you will write bugs and features and like uh, well, bugs and features. Yeah, I'd probably do both. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you will you will do mistakes and you will sort of it doesn't go smoothly. Like the, the like that's the, that that is exactly the planning fallacy is that like I'll just put these m logical pieces in the place in, the, in my timeline and then hop onto my train and like just like chuck chuck through the whole process. That's not really how it really how it goes, but at least you tried putting all the sort of pieces in the like lay them out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just as a quick comment, one thing to like keep in mind is that like when we have small small pieces that are quite under understandable, but of course when you add uh, lots of those small pieces, the total complexity increases, and usu usually usually if, if you don't like if you if you can't refactor and so on. It easily easily gets a little bit slower and slower to add the new new pieces. So, mm -hmm. it, it one one plus one plus one might be more than three. Yeah, Th there's another old programmer's joke is that like it's called the ninety ninety rule. The n the n the, ni the ninety percent of the first ninety percent will take the ninety percent of your project time, and the last ten percent will also take the ninety percent of your project time. <laughs> uh, about what Toku just say that. Uh, I realize that once you are gathering the, the backlog to, to agree with the client what sh it should be done, in the end of the project, just 20% was what you agreed in the beginning, and 80% it's what you agree after you start the project. Yeah, uh, that's where awesome project management and negotiation, <laughs> hostage negotiation <laughs> skills kicks in. So yeah. Never split the difference. Friends, I am afraid we have to stop. Let's ask, uh, 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 do, do we have any questions from the other sides, please? No? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting the throat cutting em em emote from So Tumblr, are you so saying that we'll, we'll come and hunt you, Miro, or? <laughs> yeah, that would be appropriate. Hey, let's give another big round of applause. Thank you very much, Miro, that was awesome.